in old times when people would celebrate warriors returning from battle, offering them libations, gifts, sculpting and painting images of their likeness and putting them on public display, documenting their feats in battle and transmitting these documents and stories to subsequent generations, the Orthodox Church celebrates its own warriors. For the Orthodox Church, invasions of the Byzantine realm were less a physical threat compared to the incursions and campaigns of those whose aims were to innovate beyond the apostolic tradition and along an undisturbed line of Christian thought and belief. The heresies were considered more insidious than any invading armies because they sounded correct and they were motivated by very gifted orators and even clergy. The greatest honor bestowed by the Orthodox Church to warriors was not to the military leaders of Byzantium, but to those individuals that collectively comprise what the Church refers to as the choir and the symphony of the Holy Fathers. The Church celebrates each of the Holy Fathers individually on the day of their passing, on days dedicated to Synaxis in honor of individual fathers, but more importantly, the Church celebrates the Holy Fathers collectively at specific times during the ecclesiastic year, as it reaffirms the decisions they made at each of the councils, ecumenical and local. By demonstrating such respect and gratitude to the Holy Fathers, some of which were exiled by emperors and even their own peers, the Church not only affirms their teachings and decisions into its foundation and way of life, but more importantly, it celebrates their faith and unwavering stance against the ideas that, contemporary as they were, did not fit the apostolic tradition. The hymnology dedicated to the collective of the Holy Fathers is rich in its portrayal of their voices and struggles as a symphony, as trumpets in harmony, in mystical unison with the Logos, the Word of God. The hymnology dedicated to the Holy Fathers, the first celebration as a collective coming up this month of October, is weaved in such a manner that makes the central Christologic dogma of the Church accessible to everyone. To the catechumen, the hymns succinctly summarize the nature of Christ according to the apostolic tradition and also highlight the various deviations that threatened this tradition. The same hymns speak to the theologian and the scholar, albeit at different levels. The poetic simplicity is deceptive, for it is crafted in such a manner that elicits a voyage into the depths of Christian philosophy on a colorful canvas of endless poetic shades and hues. It must be noted that the poetry of the hymnographers, dedicated to the Holy Fathers, many times characterized by a solemn, agonized lyricism around the main concern of the hymnographer and every Christian, salvation of the soul, is not necessarily only a clean, soulless, and systematic treatise of dogma. The hymnographers always exhibited a freedom of thought in their works that, nevertheless, never strayed from the apostolic teachings.
The hymn that we just heard is direct in its treatment of the Holy Trinity as one, an unchanging essence and Godhead. At the same time, the hymnographer liberally celebrates those who upheld this view, the Holy Fathers, as mystical trumpets of the Spirit, as God-bearing, that is, inspired and wearing the essence of the Father, singing a harmonious melody of theology in the midst of the Church. These words are very carefully selected. The fathers are God-bearing, and they are trumpets, authoritative and absolute, in their harmonious melody in the midst of the church that is the center of attention and the guides of the Christian community. 
The translation harmonious melody does a disservice to the original Greek, melos and harmonion, which refers to a musical modal expression of poetry. In ancient Greece and in Byzantine music, the enharmonic mode is reserved for music that is of a militaristic character, of a directive nature, one that is not necessarily subject to debate or disrespect. Thus, the hymnographer portrays the overthrowers of Arius, the formidable priest of the 3rd century CE, who promoted the doctrine that Christ the Son cannot be the self-existent and immutable God, as God is unique and alone self-existent, a doctrine that nearly deviated the entire church from the apostolic tradition. This doctrine was finally challenged at the First Ecumenical Council as the champions of the Orthodox repudiated its basis and its teaching. The hymnographer portrays these defenders of the true faith as those who keep the unblemished and correct teachings. The hymn was composed to be sung in plagal second mode, with modal changes to highlight the enharmonic yet mystical trumpets of the Spirit, the God-bearing Fathers. The term Ecumenical Council refers to an imperially ordered summit to discuss, accept, or refute, affirm or deny matters of ecclesiastic faith, doctrine, dogma, in a manner that reflects an orthodox foundation, that is, the correct belief and the correct profession of the faith. Ecumenical councils can and were convened to ratify the works of prior councils, especially when convened with the participation of the entirety of the patriarchs, archbishops, and bishops of the church body. The ecumenical councils and their decisions for the Orthodox Church are the highest level of authority that governs the church and guides its teachings and traditions as well as its manner of operation. The decisions and guidances of ecumenical councils are quite detailed, even to minutiae of daily dress and diet and behavior by clergy and lady alike. There are few day details of life that the councils did not consider. The ecumenical councils represent the highest possible authority and authenticity on all matters of the faith. To this day, the Church and its administration is governed by the decisions and guidances of the ecumenical councils. These decisions and guidances are collectively termed canons, not to be confused with a poetic canon, and have both juridical as well as pastoral authority. The decisions of the ecumenical councils are also considered Catholic, in that they represent the views and consensus of all the Christian communities, and each successive council cannot contradict the decisions and guidances of previous councils. Instead, the decisions and guidances exhibit incremental, steady advances and evolutions of previous decisions. In essence, the decisions reflect the evolution of the Church, always rooted in the apostolic tradition. The term synod in the ecclesiastic sense first appears in the 37th Apostolic Canon, whereas the term ecumenical synod first appears in the 6th Canon of the Second Ecumenical Council in 381 CE. Ecumenical councils, as noted earlier, were convened by imperial order in response to ecclesiastic application for such. These councils were intended to resolve matters of faith that challenged the ecclesiastic as well as the social order of the empire. Concurrently, as the correct faith was affirmed in the councils, matters of ecclesiastic and social conduct were adopted as part of their decisions. The Church gives special emphasis to the first, the fourth, and the seventh ecumenical councils, celebrated on the seventh Sunday of the Pentecostarion period, in July and in October, respectively. The reason why the Sixth Council is not celebrated in our Church is because its commemoration falls on the 14th of September, the same day the Church celebrates the ever-important Feast of the Elevation of the Cross. The Sixth Ecumenical Synod convened in 680 CE in the month of November inside the Imperial Palace and specifically underneath one of the major domes, hence its reference as the Council of Trullo, the Dome. 
This council brought to a close 50 years of theologic and ecclesiastic ecclesiologic debates, especially the critical debate on whether Christ was God-man, that is, perfect God and perfect man, in one hypostasis, that is, in one person, with two identical in essence and force energies, or whether the divine nature was superior to or unique as his essence and will. This synod condemned the Christology of monothelitism and those that promoted it among the communities and the churches. Monothelitism, which defines a significant aspect of the Coptic Church, proclaims that Christ's essence and nature is solely and uniquely divine and that any human nature and essence is minimal and subservient to the divine. In contrast and in line with the Gospels and the apostolic teachings and tradition, the fathers who participated in the Sixth Council affirmed that Christ had two equal and undivided essences and wills, equal in force and substance, the divine and the human, in a union of perfect God and perfect man, in the person of Christ. In fact, monothelitism was a 7th century embodiment of the earlier condemned heresy of monophysitism, condemned at the Fourth Ecumenical Council in Chalcedon in 451 CE. The tenacity of the proponents of these outlying views and their challenge and defiance of the Church is described by the hymnology for the Holy Fathers quite vividly. They are described as slanderers, blasphemous prattlers, and using the words of St. Paul the Apostle, ravenous wolves. The next hymns are used in the commemorations for all the synods, and the hymnographers are very careful in how the poems are crafted. In the first hymn, the Holy Fathers are depicted as careful investigators guided by the Divine Spirit, welding together all spiritual knowledge. The choice of the word knowledge is not happenstance. It reflects universal, natural truths. And examining the revered creed, that is, the Orthodox teachings, in order to trace it out following the teachings of the Apostles. The hymnographer demonstrates that the Holy Fathers did not act arbitrarily, but followed solid foundations of faith and teaching. Thus, their pronouncements on the heresies were not arbitrary, but a consequence of knowledge, guidance by a solid foundation of faith and tradition and the Holy Spirit. The second hymn, now that the basis of the Father's decisions is established, goes on to illustrate that their decisions and the rationale for those decisions do not need many words to understand. However, those few words are rich in meaning. The hymnographer then seals the argument with a proclamation that all the decisions whose groundwork was described in the first hymn are now godly traditions and revelations received from on high, enlightened, and set forth the faith taught them by God. These truths and revelations in faith and tradition are also celebrated in one of Orthodox Christianity's poetic and musical masterpieces, the doxasticon that wraps up the matins services of all the commemorations of the Holy Fathers. A poem by Georgios of Nicomedia, it is also a musical masterpiece that has survived more than 500 years of musical innovations and heresies. Oh, my God. 
The mystical fragrance that is produced by the sweet-scented flowers of paradise, the salvational and sweet light that is splashed by the brightly shining stars of the spiritual firmament and the impregnable towers of the mystical Zion, that is, the Church of Christ, this mystery of theology, which is revealed by the golden mouths of the Word, cannot be understood or lived except only when one walks along the steady and firm path established by the apostles and then walked on by the holy fathers for it is they and their guidance that are safe vehicles by which we can come to know the truth about our faith and traditions and to come to know these truths the hymnology of the orthodox church comes to teach us with a few poems what scholars and theologians can only offer in thousands of pages and footnotes the principal characteristic of the Orthodox faith of the Holy Fathers is its symphony. This symphony is not due to the theologic schools of thought or academies where the Holy Fathers were educated, but is due to the Holy Spirit through which they were able to understand the teachings of their predecessors in order that they articulate more precisely, more incisively, and above all, within the realm of teachings based on the apostolic tradition. It is within this symphony of thought and treatment of the apostolic tradition where the authenticity of the Holy Fathers can be seen in what can be identified as the patristic Orthodox Church. Dear friends, earlier we heard the Doxasticon of the Matins of the Feasts of the Holy Fathers sung by the great Matthäus Tsamtiranis of late blessed memory. 
He stands among the great cantors of the 20th century with a unique vocal blessing that is hegemonic and representative of the best and most traditional cantors of Asia Minor. Some may know that he is the teacher of the current Archon Protopsaltis of the Great Church of Christ at the Church of St. George of the Fanar, Panagiotis Neochoritis. Other than the gifts and exceptional and deep knowledge they received from their teachers, the cantors of old time, like Matthäus Tsamkiranis, were also the most Christian in character and virtue and living examples of what a giving person of Agapi to others ought to be. Today, our podcast honors this legendary proto-cantor as one of the most traditional proto-cantors of old time and an example of what today's cantors ought to strive for.
Ματθαίος Τσαμκυράνης was a distinguished Καλιφόνικ πρωτοψάλτης, choir director, and music teacher from among the very best of the 20th century. He was born in the village of Ελευθερές, Πανγεο, Καβάλα, in 1925. From an early age, he was distinguished for his caliphony and his zeal for music. At the age of 13, he began his first lessons in Byzantine music from Leandros Violinzis, a cantor in the village of Musteni, and then from Georgios Parascudis, who was a professor at the Athoniada school for 26 years. Later, he enriched his musical knowledge in Nikisiani Pangeo, where he sang as Protopsaltis, collaborating with Sotirios Sotirudis, an excellent musician and expert in the theory of Byzantine music. Finally, in the period after 1953, he was taught many details and minutiae of Byzantine chant at a very high level in terms of expression and chanting style by the great Protopsaltis Athanasios Karamanis. His formal service as cantor to the church began at a very young age. In the period 1943 to 1944, he sang in the three villages of Elefteres, Nea Peramos, and Nea Iraklitsa, and in fact in Greek and Bulgarian, since the churchgoers were Greek and Bulgarian Orthodox. In the period 1946 to 1951, he turned to self-taught learning of musical instruments. This is how he learned to play the guitar, buzuki, and the oud, and for this period he founded under his direction a musical company with which he performed professional musical programs. He sang successively at the church of the entrance of the Theotokos to the temple at Nikisia Nipangeo between 1951 and 1953, at the Dormition of the Virgin of Sindos in Thessaloniki between 1953 to 1954, at the Annunciation of Sidiro Castro for a year, and then settled in Kavala and sang at Holy Forerunner between 1954 to 1964, at St. Nicholas, between 1964 to 1987, at Holy Cross, 1987 to 1989, at St. Lucas, 1989 to 1992, and from 1992 until, until his late years, he adorned and shone with his magnificently expressive, hegemonic, and solemn style as Protopsaltis of the Church of St. Pandeleimon in Polichni, Thessaloniki. Between 1959 to 1980, he founded and directed a Byzantine choral ensemble with which he offered many notable concerts. He is also the founder of the Association of Friends of Byzantine Music of Kavala, founded in 1976. As a music teacher, he has taught the art of chanting to a number of students, many of whom are today's accomplished cantors and lambadarii, most prominent, the current Archon Protopsaltis of the Great Church of Christ at the Patriarchal Church of St. George, Panagiotis Neochoritis. A great man with excellent morals and straight character, modest and kind-hearted, Matthäus Tsamkiranis has numerous friends and devotees and imitators of his chanting art throughout Greece, which he has traveled from time to time and has sung upon invitation. Caliphonic, gifted with a beautiful, nimble, and melodious voice and a serious ecclesiastic singing style, he sings respectfully of tradition with dignity and enthusiasm. He has also recorded many cassettes with Byzantine church hymns as well as folk songs in which one witnesses his unparalleled talent. He passed though in the Lord in August of 2006. Dear friends, among the questions we received over the course of our podcasts are the following. Why do we sing, as post-principal feast day troparia of the Matins, those of the principal feast day and not those indicated inside the Mineon? And the second question, what is the practice of the Kelefson immediately prior to the Matins Louds in the presence of a hierarch, and is it sung in the mode of the Louds? Let us answer the first question. It refers to what in Greek are called metheorta troparia. The metheorta, or post-principal feast day troparia, are those that are sung every day between the principal dominical or Marian feast day and on its leave-taking. The reason is to prolong the joyous message and the experience of the principal feast. In the extant Minea manuscripts between the 10th to the 13th century CE, 
The hymns of every feast are grouped together or presented in smaller groups interspersed inside other hymns of the feast. This arrangement is also copied in the services of the days between the principal feast day and its leave-taking, and their totality or only some of these are directed to be sung on the days between the principal feast day and the leave-taking. For example, in the 11th century CE Mineon of December of the Library of Sinai, a series of troparia is grouped and presented under the title Troparia sung until the eve of the Nativity of Christ. Inside the same Mineon, under the rubrics of the 25th of December, a series of 30 troparia are presented as a group under the title Stihira Prosomia, sung following the eve of the feast. The cantor orders their singing at the Vespers and at the Louds. In another Mineon of the 13th century CE, in the section of the 14th of September, one finds a series of troparia under the heading Other Idiomela sung at the glory to the Father and the and now and forever and unto the ages, beginning tomorrow and until the eighth day, that is, the leave-taking of the Feast of the Elevation of the Holy Cross. As subsequent generations of manuscripts came into being, copied from the originals, these grouped hymns began to be dispersed to be sung on the individual days between the principal feasts and its leave-taking as directed by the tipica of the monastery or the general available tipica in use. Concerning which of these hymns were to be sung on the Sunday between the principal feast day and the leave-taking, the note inside the Sunday rubrics was that the vesperal stihira to be sung are those that were sung at the Lord have I have cried to you of the principal day and at the louds, the four at the louds of the feast. These specific directives remained in print for only a few of the major dominical feast days. These are for the period of the Nativity of Christ, following mid-Pentecost, and following the Ascension. The newer tipica, those of Constantinos Protopsaltis and Georgios Violakis, copied these specific directives from the handwritten manuscripts for only those particular feasts. Instead of carefully going back to the original sources, these two tipica erred in directing other troparia to be sung as post-feastal hymns, to the point of ordering the singing of prosomia sung on the prologos equals to Ephratha, house of Ephratha, as post-feastal louds, out of line of the accepted practice, where these prosomia were to be sung only as apostica troparia. Indeed, the transition from hand copying to lithograph printing in the 18th century gave the power to mostly unlearned printers to consider what to copy from the handwritten manuscript into litho print. And in almost all instances, the printers were unable to discern the older directives concerning which of the troparia were to be sung as post-feastal hymns. And thus, almost all lithographed books replaced the hymns of the principal feast day with those of the apostica at the louds. Therefore, it is historically and ecclesiologically correct to sing the troparia stihira or the prosomia of the louds of the principal feast day at the louds of every day, including Sundays, between the principal feast day and its leave-taking, following the resurrectional stihira on Sundays. Concerning the second question we received, what is the practice of the Kelefson immediately prior to the Matins Louds in the presence of a hierarch? And is it sung in the mode of the Louds? The word Kelefson is the imperative of the infinitive of the verb Kelevo, which means the following. When a person higher in rank calls it to someone of lower rank or equal rank, it is an order, it is a directive. When a person of lower rank calls it to someone of higher rank, it is a respectful and warm request and petition. In this second situation, it is a respectful petition by a reader or a canonarche to the hierarch at the start of Vespers, especially in monasteries, as well as a petition for the beginning of the singing of the first prokimenon at the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. Concerning the most traditional approach of the Kelefson immediately prior to the singing of the Vesperal, Lord I Have Cried, and the start of the Louds, 
which is that of the Mother Church, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the sequence is as follows. Two readers or two canonarchs from each of the Tuanaloya, the left and the right, concurrently walk to assemble solemnly at the center of the Solea to face the hierarch who is at the throne standing. The reader from the right side Analoyon stands to the right of the reader from the left side Analoyon. It is customary for the reader of the right side Analoyon to intone the phrase Kielefson Vespota Agie Ichos, the mode of the Stichira of the Vespers or of the Louds. Unlike some modern practices, the hierarch does not begin singing, Lord, I have cried. In fact, it has been strict tradition, that is, it is the realm of the first chanter, and indeed this has been the case for centuries at the Mother Church. The readers, or canonarchs, remain in place until the phrase, Lord I have cried, is sung for a second time, or, in the louds, the, ve the verse, praise him, begins to be sung. Then the readers first lightly bow as they face the hierarch, and then they offer three prostrations. The reader, who intoned the Kelefson, solemnly walks to the hierarch and receives a blessing and kisses the hand of the hierarch without extending his hand to touch the hand of the hierarch. This reader then walks backwards to his original place at the Solea, whereupon the other reader goes to the hierarch for the same blessing and response. Once assembled together again at the Solea, the two readers offer three prostrations facing the hierarch, and immediately then, they lightly bow and return, as coordinated as possible, to the Analoya. Now, in what mode is the Kielefson intoned? In the video you will see next, there are a few examples of authentic and tradi traditional intonations of the Kielefson. It is strictly intoned in the manner of the Kliton, that is, with the thong the acting as Ga, inside an enharmonic tetrachord. Please listen now to a traditional and authentic approach as sung for more than a century at the Mother Church, at the Fanar in Constantinople. Dear friends, the Holy Church decreed that we celebrate and honor the memory of the fathers of the first, fourth, and seventh ecumenical councils, and certainly this did not happen by chance. There is a theological reason, a serious reason, a reason that is related to our life itself. On the day of the Ascension, our Lord Jesus Christ saying goodbye, so to speak, to the disciples and returning to heaven near God the Father, said to them, I will not leave you orphans. He does not leave us alone, and in fact our Lord announces on the Mount of Olives that he will also send the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, who makes up the whole institution of the Church, who distributes the gifts within the Church, and who makes up the unity by healing the weak ones and filling in that which is missing. Therefore, in this climate, the presence of this love of God, who does not separate and does not leave us as orphans, is felt immediate and alive by the fathers of the church. It is also in the middle of October that Jesus Christ will say to us all, proof that I do not leave you alone, proof that I do not leave you orphans, proof that I have not escaped and escaped from history, proof that I am present in history is the fact that I am sending God-bearing fathers and teachers who stand as guardians to guard the true faith, to protect the true faith, to stand by humankind, to stand by the church, to become guardians of the sanctuaries themselves and of the faithful, our faith and tradition. Our Holy Church gives us great comfort towards the middle of the coming month, emphasizing to all of us with a feast of the celebration of the Holy Fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council that God has not abandoned us and God manifests himself in our lives with these teachers of the faith, with, who, with those soldiers of the faith who are ready to sacrifice themselves for the sake of the truth of Christ and to protect the flock from heavy, ravenous wolves 
who want to destroy unity, disturb the unity within the church and sow division, which is destructive, damaging, and ultimately fatal. Also, the Gospel reading urges us that the Holy Fathers of the Ecumenical Councils did nothing else than with their testimony, their confession, and their sacrifice, struggle to ensure and guard the faith and eternal life, the true faith in the person of Christ who bestows eternal life. All the events, all the teachings, all the holy persons of our church have a coherent unity, and this unity is nothing but the unity of faith in the bond of peace and love. Our holy church presents these people, these examples, to show before us our own debt as Christians, because we too are called to preserve boundaries, as the Father said, to keep our faith, to show in every way that we are heirs and children of eternal life, that we are not trapped in the perishable world and the questionable objectives of those modern-day ravenous wolves.